Hello, everyone. I'm Mitch Kapoor, and I'm the co-chair of the Kapoor Foundation. Welcome you to this very important conversation. Um, our mission is to create a more equitable technology ecosystem that addresses longstanding racial inequality, creates economic opportunity, and reflects the power and perspectives of communities of color. The evolution of artificial intelligence has very significant implications across our focus areas from CS education, from tech workforce development, to investing in new tech companies and advocating for policy change. Could not be more pleased to have with us today, founder and principal of DARE, Distributed AI Research Institute, Tim Gebru and Alex Hanna, uh, to talk about uh, all of these issues at the intersection of AI, ethics, and racial and social justice. So thank you so much for participating. Let's leap right in and could you share a bit about your background, and your personal journey in the sense of what has brought you to this work? I was a typical nerdy kid my whole life. I wanted to be a scientist. I didn't before I even knew what that was. I always said I wanted to be a scientist since I was a little kid. Um, so I just sort of followed that path. Um, and I studied analog circuit design, which is a very obscure form of electrical engineering. Um, and so I kind of just wanted to sit in my little corner and play with my circuits and whatever, you know, <laughs> I didn't want to. And I and that to me was like a safe haven when anything else outside of that was, you know, happening, any wars, anything that have impacted me or my life outside of those things. Um, I like just being able to escape into that. But over time, um, I kind of um, I started learning about how that technology itself that I thought was a safe haven from all of these other issues that impacted my own life was also used to um, perpetuate some of the inequities that, you know, many of us experience. And it's interesting. I mean, like, uh, I, I didn't really learn about that until, uh, let's say, you know, 2015, 2016-ish. Um, a few things happened. One was that I, I saw the lack, the severe lack of Black people in the field of AI, um, uh, but I still didn't connect it to the technology that was being built until um, around that time uh, where there was this ProPublica article that talked about how um, a, a number of startups were using, purporting to uh, do crime recidivism, um, kind of, uh, what is it called, like, uh, you know, estimate the probability that someone would commit a crime again. And that was really shocking to me because on the one hand, I see the people who would be building those systems and, you know, uh, their attitudes. And on the other hand, you know, I, I'm seeing the systems being built. And so since then, that's kind of when I started connecting um, the tech that's being built to the issues that many of us face. Um, and that's how I started getting into this space. And then, of course, I still worked at tech companies, then I got fired and <laughs> I had to build my own thing. <laughs> and, you know, um, yeah, so that's kind of a short story of how I came to, to this work. And I met Alex while at Google. Um, and so Alex, yeah, tell us how you got to this, um, to work on this. Yeah, totally. Uh, I was also a big nerd growing up. I didn't go into circuit design, but ended up majoring in computer science, but also um, at the the year I went into undergrad, uh, the U.S. invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, and that was in 2003. So I got very politically active and concerned about the use of weapons and uh, different technology, but also kind of, you know, was interested in understanding um, the relationship between kind of the U.S.'s place in the world and foreign policy. And so I... Um, also majored in sociology, and I ended up um, made, uh, going and doing a PhD in sociology. Um, and so I uh, was still bringing kind of a tech-inflected view, I uh, was interested in things like how activists use social media, interested in um, how that use of social media also was a vector of surveillance of those activists. Um, so even though they'd be using things like Facebook to organize, this is, I was looking at Egypt in particular, um, it was also a way for those activists to have 
States Police look at what they were doing. Um, I did a dissertation on trying to understand and use machine learning tools to code lots amounts of data uh, about movements and mostly for study for social movement scholarship, but then also saw the flip side of it again, of it being a surveillance tool, especially when a lot of the military was interested in that. And so, um, and then, so I became very critical of this work um, and started being very interested in these kinds of emerging um, fields of what's been called AI ethics or algorithmic fairness. Um, but it's gone a lot deeper than that. that. I think those fields are, and those names are a little reductive for the whole bevy of things that goes on in this space. Um, and so I met to meet when I was at Google, I managed to be the first sociologist, research scientist at Google, uh, thanks to Tim Meat and, and Meg Mitchell, and um, started working with them in there. And then after Tim Meat and Meg were fired, uh, also decided <laughs> I, did, I had overstayed my welcome and uh, got out of there. So th thank you for that. And maybe you could explain uh, for folks who aren't familiar, what were you working on uh, at, at Google? What was, you know, describe it a little bit. What happened? And then what was your takeaway from uh, those experiences? To me? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll see a little bit. So at Google, um, Meg Mitchell, who used to be my co-lead for the Ethical AI team, created a very small research team called the Ethical AI team. And so <clears throat> the goal was to create a little, you know, we knew that we weren't, you know, um, that naive. Like we knew it's hard to, um, you know, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that... <laughs> You're seeing AI in action that somehow this Zoom puts a little thumbs up. <laughs> it's a bug. It's odd. That's really <laughs> funny. Sorry, yeah. So um, so the ethical AI team, you know, we were not we were not that naive. Like we knew that it's hard to um steer the a ship as big as Google, but um we still wanted to do what we could uh, while we were there. So we created a research, um, Meg Mitchell created a research team that, that whose goal is to basically say what your uh, goal is in uh, the k Foundation, which is to make sure that, um, to mitigate the harms of AI system and try to make it as beneficial as possible um, for society. And so we knew that in order to do that, we had to have an interdisciplinary team. So that's where Alex comes in. Um, it, it was highly unusual at Google to have a research, research uh, sociologist as a research scientist. We had to change the whole hiring process. Um, and of course, um, diverse and inclusive, you know, I know those words can mean a lot of things to diff, um, many people, but that we had to prioritize the views of people who are marginalized. Um, and so, you know, so that was our goal. And we had to come up with little tricks to make sure our work was, could be, um, you know, um, uh, rewarded at Google. Like, for example, most people would have to write down how many products they launched. And we had to say how many products we stopped the launch off because they were harmful. <laughs> and, you know, how do you get a company to reward you for that? Um, and so what happened was that um, at some point, um, we became too critical. So that I think, you know, we were very critical from day one and not just about technology, but um, you know, discrimination in the workplace, because those two things are connected. Uh, but I would say um, the final nail in the coffin was when we wrote um, in our team a paper called On the Dangers of Stochastic Parrots, Can Language Models Be Too Big? And this was a paper about what are called language models. And these are models that are trained on vast amounts of textual data on the web and are trained to basically predict the most likely sequences of words. Um, so around 2020, um, you know, OpenAI came out with um, its uh, GPT-3 um, and, you know, people were super excited. So that's the precursor to chat GPT and other, you know, uh, now that a lot of different companies have similar, similar things. And people were super excited about this this um, this thing that they're seeing, um, and it was right around the Black Lives Matter protests, actually BLM protests over the summer. Um, and so many of us were saying, "Well, you can be excited about it, but what about like the dangers? What about the fact that um, you can have 
of discriminatory um, textual outputs? What about the resource consumption of these systems? And why are you so interested in just making it bigger and bigger? What's the point of bigger and bigger? Let's think about this. Um, and so once we wrote that paper, um, it went through the entire you know p review process internally and externally. And at some point um, later on, they said that uh, that it wasn't appropriate to uh, publish it and that we needed to either retract the paper or take the names of the Google um, authors off the paper. And I actually, you know, and I said I was willing to take my name off, provided that we would have a conversation about um, that process by which this was decided upon, because it wasn't a process that we knew of. And also a larger conversation about how our team could um, function at Google, because this is a team of highly critical people. This is our job. Right. And they didn't agree to that. And they said I resigned, which I didn't. You know, so we our team came up with a word for it called resignated. You get resignated. <laughs> And, and that's what happened. Um, and to a certain extent, it was a blessing in disguise because, you know, um, we uh, started DARE afterwards, the Distributed AI Research Institute. And the goal of our institute is to not just fight fires, you know, when, when there's issues, but to also think about, you know, what are the foundations um, for making technology actually work for us, right? We don't only want to yell at people, tell them they're doing something bad. We also want to um, imagine what a different future would look like. So that's the arc of uh, of what happened. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess it's inescapable all the hype about AI everywhere else. Um, I'm interested in your take when you look at the risks that you're concerned about of various kinds. Kind of, could you talk a little bit about you know those different categories or buckets of of risks, and also whether you think where where you think there needs to be better or different public dialogue about them. You, Alex, who has a whole series about AI hype and a book coming out. So I'll let you talk about that, Alex. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, we need to nip in the bud the kind of thought that the, the most important risk is what's been called existential risk. The idea that robots are going to get so smart, they're going to no longer need uh, humans anymore. That seems to be the focus of much of the hype. It's captured many of the conversations um, and has captured many of the minds of lawmakers, uh, not only in the US, but also the UK and the EU and in different places. But that's not where the most major risks are, even though that's the most hypiest. It's also the most impossible. impossible. Um, and it's, it's one that is also kind of tied to a certain kind of delusion of grandeur of the people making these things. Um, like the things that are the most popular models now we see are large language models um, as the types of models that to meet describe the things that work by ingesting a whole bunch of data and then doing some fancy prediction of the next word and stringing together certain kinds of sentences and also text to image models. But the biggest risks that we have are in a few different domains. Um, one of the biggest risks we see First is the risk that's to people, working people, people who are at work. Um, so this is in two domains, um, kind of in two sides of it. One is the fact for these things to work at all, they actually require a huge amount of data um, and that that data needs to be managed and curated by a huge underclass of workers. And so even though it seems like magic when you type in a prompt and ChatGPT gives you this thing, um, that data has had to be annotated or munched through by a lot of different people that get unacknowledged. They're typically in the majority world slash global south. Um, they're typically paid incredibly low wages. Um, in Kenya, for instance, it was, it was shown they were, they were getting paid $1.77 a day. Um, and so, this is a persistent problem. They also get paid to screen out the horrible stuff in those data. Um, so they see violence, score, uh, awful kinds of prompts, both in text models and image models. So that's on one side of it. To even get there, we need a huge amount of work. But 
then it's threatening a whole class of jobs um, that in, in, and in, in such a way that it's threatening those jobs, it can't actually replace those jobs, but it can make those jobs a lot worse. Um, so for instance, um, there's lots of this talk of things like self-driving cars. Um, and most recently in California, the um, California Public Utilities Commission had allowed commercial use of robo taxis, but it wasn't until basically um, this uh, this pedestrian got dragged under one of those cars after they got pushed into the road. They said, well, we need to take these things off the road. Um, and so those things were threats to different kinds of taxi drivers, rideshare drivers, rideshare still rideshare services like Lyft and Uber still subsidize so much of their work. They expect drivers to subsidize a lot of that work. So it's not actually going to push them out because it's not cost saving for the coast companies, but they actually want to try to get there. But really they're going to do a lot of that work of babysitting those. Also, there was also just a report that much of the um, self-drivingness is also fake, um, that a lot of just the sort of tricky situations still need to be reviewed by low paid workers and typically in, in the majority world. Um, but then we're also seeing these in other domains, like in artists, um, artists are being threatened, they're seeing their work be uh, used to train these models, uh, but they're also seeing um, their, uh, their works in the, in the same marketplace getting pushed out at a fraction of the price. So we've seen it in um, be a core demand of the Writers Guild of America strike and also the, the Screen Actors Guild strikes, both of which have settled now with provisions to protect their work um, with um, uh, and against generative AI tools. Um, so I think that's a big, a big one. I'd say we've also seen risks that happen in consumer products. Um, a lot of the kinds of things that we've seen have been in the, the medical, the medical domain, also the legal domain, um, like providing advice for people in the medical domain or providing legal advice. Um, but these are things that are not guaranteed uh, to give good results, to give reliable results. Uh, there was a lawyer that was um, using ChatGPT to write briefs, for instance, and he found out that it was referencing case law that didn't exist. Um, which you know, if that's your lawyer, that's that's not a that's not a good thing to feel. Uh, medical tools, um, and we even have people on record like uh, Greg Corrado, a VP at Google, who says we have this new tool um, called MedPalm that. It can be used for diagnostics, but I wouldn't want my family to be subject to it. So it's kind of this thing where it's like, you know, we're going to have uh, machines um, for for the poor, but, you know, uh, human care for everybody else. Um, and then we have the risk of anthropomorphizing these things in, in general. We're granting the companies a lot of power when we do that. We say these things are smart. These things are superhuman. Um and there's a risk just in that discourse because what it seems to do is that it kind of prioritizes um, a lot of expertise into these tools and really denying a lot of the ways that humans are novel and creative and can think in very important ways. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a bevy of risks and all of them I think are more important than this imagined hypothetical um, existential risk. So lots and lots of areas of risk, virtually every area of life. I guess the question is a follow-up that occurs to me is how much of these risks are, are transient, either because we haven't learned how to use the technology or the technology is still uh, immature. I, you know, will it evolve? Or to what extent and in what ways are the risks sort of fundamental to this uh, class of technology. I mean, I'm not looking for a total pronouncement on this, but you know, your thoughts on because uh, on that because what we do pragmatically really seems to matter depending on you know that dimension of risk. So, any thoughts there? I was going to add that um, <clears throat> um, all of the risks that Alex talked about um, with respect to generative AI systems. We haven't even touched um, the other <laughs> systems, right? Um, the mundane ones, the ones of uh, face recognition, the ones of automate, you know, automated weapons and things like that. And so 
what the hype does is it 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 makes it such that we don't even talk about those existing risks that we haven't you know mitigated and now we've created new ones um my point of view on on your question about whether these are transient or not is um first of all i think there was a really good talk that emily and bender gave about chat it's called chat gpt why <laughs> when is it appropriate to use something like chat gpt and when is it not and um any any time where you need factual information and it is and especially if it is information that has consequences you shouldn't be using something like that because it it has not been trained to 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 do that right um and maybe there's you know some people have research on like maybe it can start providing citations or anything but that's just not the kind of um the kind of uh, thing we have right now the second thing is, even in those cases, you have to ask the question of, is it worth the environmental cost? Because that's one thing that a lot of people are not talking about right now, is that the environmental costs are staggering, not just for building these systems, but for even every single time all of us are interacting with these systems. So do you want to have a system whose foundation is staggering environmental costs and labor exploitation? Even if we wanted to have generative AI systems, let's say that people work um, with, it should not, the foundation should not be theft of data and exploitation of labor, right? Um, but, and many times, many of these um, products can be, can be achieved with other um, much simpler things like somebody wrote about gzip and and we were laughing that oh my god it's an existential threat to humanity because it's not performing you know some of these other things right so the question is you know why do we need to go down this road i understand why open ai and friends want to go down this road because if you centralize if you take the world's data and you say that you can sell one model for everyone and every single company is building on top of your model that's a lot of power and that's a lot of money that you're going to have as one company. But I don't understand why we, we the rest of us, would want to go down this road. And so, um, for instance, at DARE, we're working on supporting smaller organizations that are not trying to have a monopoly, right? That each um, care about their own communities and they build small task-specific models um, and collaborate with other organizations that do that, right? So we're not like anti-technology. We still, we're all technologists, but we don't understand why we have to go down this road. So, you know, that's interesting. Um, I guess in that world that you're talking about with more distributed, smaller groups, less dominated by oligopoly, um, how can you also address the environmental concerns and um, the labor exploitation concerns that you identified as uh, problematic? Well, one of the problems of these systems is just the amount of scale that they're intended to take up. Just, just as in, as a matter of what Tanit was saying, um, you know, Chat GPT they, or Jack, the GPT model you know, class of models, they're really trying to be everything machines. You know, we're, we can do, we can have a bunch of training and this training costs incredibly, it costs a lot, it's environmentally costly, as well as the cost of doing inference is actually very high as well, environmentally as well. And so why are we going to, you know, there it has to do with a bit of centralization of this. But there are ways of really approaching it in such a way where you can collect limited amounts of data, you can compensate people more fairly for their data, and that you can train a very a much smaller model that's not going to be as environmentally costly. And so, you know, one of our partners is uh, Lysanda AI, uh, their founder, Asma Vashteka, and, you know, he's developing tools for machine translation and um, and automatic speech recognition in um, Amparak and Tigrinya. Um, and, you know, going through the process of actually finding text, of interviewing people, of getting voice uh, data. I mean, it's a very, it's a much, it's a, a slower methodological process, but it's doing it in uh, relation with people in, in those communities, those language speakers. 
um, you can kind of counter pose this with um, how companies like Meta or Google go about this, which is they try to find this, uh, they either try to find this stuff on the web, um, they ask people to volunteer, and I'm doing air quotes here, if this is, uh, if we're just hearing it, they ask people to volunteer their data, or they find really weird sources. So for instance, the, um, the meta model that uses, um, they say they can do, I think, 400 uh, automated speech recognition um, uh, and uh, 400 languages. It, it uses uh, many different parallel translations in voice to speech of the Bible. Now, they use this, and many of that is, is, is uh, released through particular sorts of organizations that um, are intending to do very, be very missionary in order. And they do this because they are trying to, you know, have various kind of Christian missions. So that does a few things. That is one kind of tracing colonial pathways of how language and knowledge is generated. Um, second, it is possibly biasing that purely towards kind of Christian or old language. Um, and three, it's not really done with community involvement or compensation. Um, and so, uh, and then when you actually use these tools, they actually do quite a bad job of actually doing what they said they were going to do in machine translation and automatic speech recognition. But it also does the thing where it uh, disempowers existing um, existing founders, uh, people like Asmalash, other folks um, in their communities who are building technology to work in their communities. So it has multiple negative externalities. Um, whereas having an alternative vision even if we don't know exactly what that is, at least we're trying to build or helping enable people to build things that are gonna work for them in their communities. So clearly there are different paths we could take in society about how we develop this technology. Meanwhile, in the here and now, the big companies are racing ahead as fast as they can uh, President Biden in the U.S. issued an executive order on uh, AI. I turn to you and ask, what's your perspective on what kind of policy and regulation we might need right now, uh, particularly, for instance, in mitigating uh, big harms impacting communities of color or other very current risks? So, um if it was any other time and I saw this executive order, I would be super excited. I would delve into it because, you know, I know there's some some stuff in there about small models. There's stuff in there about transparency. However, this was announced right at the time as what we're seeing happening in Gaza and our entire team is just horrified. And there's a lot of AI enabled um atrocities that are happening there, right? So then our our kind of head went to what are we doing about these kinds of weapons that are being experimented on vulnerable groups like Palestinians and exported around the world? Um, uh, so we're going to have an event on that. Anthony uh, Lowenstein, is that, am I pronouncing his name correctly? He just wrote a, a really important book um, called The Palestine Laboratory. So we were very much um, focused on regulating these big tech companies and making sure that they wouldn't exploit labor because um, even Mark Andreessen just admitted <laughs> that if they had to pay for the data uh, for these generative um, AI mo uh, generative AI models, I mean generative AI systems, that it wouldn't be um, worth investing in because uh, they wouldn't be making so much money on it, right? Because so the market calculation, their own market calculation would say that if they have to pay for the labor, they can't race as fast as you just mentioned. Um, and so I think one of the most important ways in which we could actually curb these harms, and even when we look at the weapons harms, you know, you're seeing a lot of workers galvanizing, a lot of trade unions and others, is to stop the exploitation of labor and give workers more power. And I think that would really um, get us very far in a number of domains. Um, because, again, first of all, because the workers will have more power to stop um, some of these harmful applications. And secondly, because if you cannot exploit people, you would not be able to go as fast 
you know, uh, because your market, market calculations would tell you otherwise. I, I that's why I really think that is the first, the most important part of it. Um, secondly, I do think that it's really important for the corporations to be the ones to have to prove to us through a set of tests or whatever that they are not causing harm before they release something rather than the onus being on us as individuals to prove that harm has been, um, you know, that we have been harmed or agencies to prove after the fact, right? Because um, because we don't have resources, even when you're seeing the artists who are currently litigating with these big tech companies, the courts take forever to make decisions. And in the meantime, these companies are doing whatever they want. And also as, 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 small, uh, as a small independent artist or other kinds of individuals, we don't have the time and resources to go up against these um, these large tech companies. So something they need to have to show us a few things that they've done before they release a product, right? That, that's what I really think so, that should happen. And, you know, a, a lot of the talk about how this kind of regulation um, impedes innovation, I don't understand it because what happens is actually it puts everybody on a level playing field and some of us can innovate now. We don't have to police what other tech companies are doing or yell after them. We can just innovate and, and think about what we want to do and imagine a different future. Uh, Alex, I would, yeah, please. Yeah, I would say, I would say, yeah, I mean, on that, on the vein in terms of what I want to add is, you know, it'd be amazing if we had a more comprehensive data protection regulation. Um, we don't have any of that in, in the US or not on a federal level. Um, right now, the only thing that protects artists or creators is copyright law. Copyright law is, is, pretty, um, is pretty weak and it's kind of using a very old set of regulations to um, protect uh, copyright holders. But there's also copy, it doesn't protect data subject is that doesn't actually protect anybody's likenesses within data. So having data protection regulation is uh, would be a priority, but we don't, uh, that's not really on the docket. There's no federal privacy legislation um, as well. There's some privacy um, elements of it, but it's not, it's not, it's pretty patchwork. Um, California has, has a law and there's been proposed um, legislation in, on, in the federal level, but the, that's not really moving. Uh, there's very little federal um, regulation or agency action in protecting workers. Um, the existing legislation the, is the National Labor Relations Act, uh, mostly only focuses on uh, workers um, and their right to organize, uh, right for uh, protected concerted action. Um, but even then, when workers file unfair labor practices, those take quite a long time for the NLRB to adjudicate. Um, and so, and there's very little protection against uh, workers being surveilled at work as well. Um, and so there needs to be more teeth in terms of empowering workers on a federal level. And then um, I would say, um, lastly, just, and I think this is getting what Tamit was saying is, having a sense, having accountability. So what are the kind of red lines that companies can't cross um, by virtue of deploying models? Um, having a thing like an audit is one part of a toolkit, but again, uh, the auditing space and the number of auditors uh, are kind of patchwork. And meanwhile, um, people are deploying these models in the thousands. Each company, whether it's Google, Amazon, Meta, um, OpenAI has thousands of models in operation. They don't even have to disclose when people are subject to a model. Um, we don't even know how many things they are. They don't have to meet any kind of uh, bar for testing. They don't have to know anything on discrimination, uh, how they do across different kinds of racial, gender, class, nationality, linguistic, religious, caste groups, etc. Um, and there needs to be some kind of red lines of things that they just can't build. Um, and an accountability uh, legislation could account for some of that. Um, that does it, there is some draft legislation on that, but it'd be part of this wider um, constellation of legislation and regulation we need. 
Policymakers, please take note of all of this. Let me turn now uh, more specifically to CS education uh, at the K-12 level. Uh, this is uh, being recorded for CS Education Week. Kids are exposed to this. What kind of skills should they be learning? What is What are the kinds of skills that are critical to teach so that they become engaged and aware citizens in the face of this onrush of technology? Well, I have to tell you that I was interviewed by a high school newspaper, a local high school newspaper, and like the, the critical thinking skills were much higher than so many other, um, you know, more senior people that I've talked to. So I was pleasantly surprised to see how aware they were of the issues um, with the kinds of questions they asked me. So I I really believe in this generation. Um, I think they have the right to sue all of the other generations for giving them a climate catastrophe and all sorts of other um, kind of uh, un un unliv unlivable planet that we're leaving them. And maybe that's why they've become a lot more aware. Um, and I think that's the kind of education they need. I think we need to move away. You know, there's this um, critique of the way we teach science called the view from nowhere. We, we teach science and um, STEM education in general, science engineering, etc., as if it's it's from no one's point of view, as if it's like this objective truth that is from no one's point of view, but it is from someone's point of view, and it's from the point of view of the people who've been in power for a long time. And um, a, a critical piece in this in, in, in this education that's missing is um, to teach students how to interrogate that, to teach students how to understand that science is political, technology is political, and for them to understand the ways in which that's the case and how it how it fits into current events and the current kind of makeup of society. I would say that a lot of the kinds of things I completely agree. the The kids are all right. Um, they're doing they're doing some fantastic stuff. Um, one of the things, and uh, I was at a talk yesterday given by Danae. Uh, Metaxas, who's a professor at University of Pennsylvania, and they were talking about like um, studying the way that uh, youth do like kind of um, citizen audits of like AI tools. So you know they they'll you know you, there'll be like a TikTok filter that shows you know renders their face in like manga, but then you know if you have short hair, it'll kind of render you like a man, or if you, but if you put like a mop on your head, it'll make you look like, kind of yassify it, you know, make you look more feminine. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, I think there's a really critical consciousness uh, forming with, with, with K through 12 youth and really understanding, you know, what these things are and how they're affecting their life. The stuff like people play with chat GPT and they realize they'll give either really boring kind of answers or, or whatnot. Um, but then they can kind of hack it and kind of see they're doing these kinds of citizen audits, these kind of critical things. Um, I would say, you know, one thing we could probably encourage them to do is, is to de-anthropomorphize these, anthropomorphize these things instead of saying, you know, let's ask, you know, chat GPT what he thinks or something and say, no, this is, this is a technology. This is a thing. This is this is a thing made by humans. Um, you know, you could bring it back down to earth. Um, and I think, you know, that I think they're already there. And, you know, enabling them to understand that these are literally just kind of text prediction machines um, can really help ground that a bit more. Bringing it back down to earth is a very good thought to take away from this. So for the non-technologists, which is really most of the world, and here's this onrush of technology, what kinds of actions can we all be taking now? Uh, are there specific things or is there a further point of view of perspective to be informed and engaged and not simply to be carried along on the tide of whatever the big companies uh, hand us that's the future. Um, I I would say that um, so for the people who are telling storytellers, like Hollywood hasn't been helping us out very much. 
Um, I talked to some of them during their strike and I was like, I support your strike, but you haven't been helping us out with this whole AI hype thing because, you know, a lot of people's um, understanding of AI comes from movies like Terminator or Her. um, And it would be really great if um, there were movies that were, you know, even if they're fictional, a little bit more accurate about the actual impacts of of this technology. Um, And journalists can be, can have a huge role to play. They shouldn't be stenographers of a bunch of different <laughs> high tech companies or governments, right? They need to really um, help us um, sift um, hype from reality. So I think journalists have a huge role to play, um, and and educators also should should kind of uh, consume information with a critical eye so that their students, you know, don't get again um, some propaganda versus um, reality. So um, I think we have we all have a huge role to play, but. The people that are giving us this information have a bigger role to play, I think, because you know, and if the information ecosystem is polluted, it's it's gonna it's harder for each individual to to separate fact um, from fiction. Um, and I and I think that um, the citizen audit thing is really great. I, I think everybody can kind of do that. Although again, I'm I'm hesitant to put the onus on 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 you know citizens who have a lot on their plate already. But, um, you know, I think our legislators um, should remember that there should be on the side of the people who elected them rather than um, with, you know, corporations that are that are building um, these models. I think every day people and I'm going to I like to quote this from Emily and Mender again, but people should refuse to be impressed. <laughs> you know, they need to develop kind of a what Phil Agar calls a, you know, critical, uh, critical tech consciousness. Um, I think I got that right. Um, and it's, it's sort of thinking about approaching tools, thinking about who's selling me this and why, um, whenever someone asks you to download an app, you know, where's my data going? Um, you know, what are you going to do with it? Um, whenever you're offered an AI, an AI tool, like why do they want to force this on me? Um, I think it's almost every tool now says try our AI. Um, and if you live, you know, where we live in California, you drive down the the 101 coming into San Francisco, every other billboard is an AI billboard. Uh, mostly they're they're selling these to not everyday people. They're selling these to mid-level managers because that's where gonna where they're gonna make their money. Um, so mid-level managers, I'm telling you don't buy this. Um, you know, make generative AI just flop uh, in, in what they're trying to do. Um, that's exactly what a- open AI does not want. Um, but you know, so that's that's one so I think that's the, that's one thing in our toolbox. but in the long run we need to fight on all fronts which is going to be fighting it uh, on your own, fighting it in your workplace. If you don't want AI surveillance on the job, um, if you can get this, if you're a worker, you can get this written in your contract. You need to work on that. If you're a teacher, if you're a driver, um, you know, teachers, you can have these kinds of provisions in your union contracts. And teaching is probably one of the last bastions of American unionism between uh, the two large unions in this country. Um, If you're, uh, if you're an educator trying to avoid it in the, you know, avoid it in the classroom, discouraging students from using it, um, which I know can be very, very hard, but you know, what are ways that you can write syllabi that are going to be, you know, hard and and make, make things a bit more, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm not in a, in, let me be clear. I'm, I'm not telling you to be a cop in the classroom. I'm saying, you know, like what are ways that you can have things that are a bit more creative. Um, and, and then, you know, and then legislators need to be on this too. Um, and so do regulators. Um, so we need a multi-pronged approach to make this as um, unsavory as possible. Teachers. Oh. Uh, I think we need to say to teachers, do not use these AI detection tools and, and yeah. 
students saying that they're exactly. 80%, 60% AI. We've been getting so many complaints about this. Please don't do that. These tools don't mm -hmm. work. Don't punish your students based on these tools. Yeah, and that's what I mean by like, don't be a cop. It's sorry, don't 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 start from a smart place of suspicion and say you used AI. What are kind of creative ways of doing this? Creative ways of teaching. I mean, in CS education, what are kinds of ways to do teaching activities which are, you know, which are you know maybe pen and paper or or thinking about different kinds of um, slot filling or, or things of that nature. Um, what are ways that we can help students build mental models um, that are that are kind of creative and 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 um, learning concepts? Um, but yeah, I wouldn't you know don't don't say in in a code writing project we're going to run this through a, an AI detection thing because it's not going to work. Plenty for everyone to do. And I want to, as we're closing here, first of all, thank. Both of you very much. There is so much value in what you're saying. Um, I'm going to go back over the transcript of this because I myself have some follow-up action items to this, and I hope all our listeners and viewers, uh, you know, may may do the same. And let me give you the opportunity, if you'd like, for any final concluding thought. What you'd like people to take away? What is the basis for hope? Or you know, anything that you'd like to end with, uh, Tanit? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that for me, the hope is honestly the kids, these, this generation is amazing. And so they like seeing what they, their fearlessness and what they're accomplishing um, gives me a lot of hope. Um, and also I wanna say that, um, you know, we need to support these kids innovation. So this move towards larger and larger models that you know, people see take billions upon billions of dollars to train and maintain can discourage people um, from thinking that they can invent something with uh, lower resources. But it's not true. Don't don't buy the hype if, you know, I, I'm going to close with what Asma said, that if you, uh, our fellow that um, Alex was mentioning, that if you have a connection to your community and you understand the needs and you you uh, learn a little bit of um, the field, whether it's machine learning or something else, you can, that can take you a lot farther than their one size fits all approach. So don't be discouraged. And I think we should support um, innovators in that way. Thank you. Alex. Yeah, Tanit said mostly what I wanted to say, but I'll just, you know, reiterate some words, especially I haven't had a lot of hope in the past five weeks, but um, uh, since uh, since the uh, attack on Gaza began, but, you know, I would encourage us to really, um, I'm thinking a lot of it, the words of Marianne Kaba, um, who's uh, a writer and abolitionist, who says hope is a discipline. So we need to kind of hope and have hope every day. Um, and also kind of inhabiting uh, the kind of uh, Palestinian philosophy of uh, Sumun, which is uh, translates roughly as steadfastness. So it's knowing that, you know, you this is, this is a world that you inhabit and have strength in. Um, so even when the odds are very overwhelming, um, you know, uh, it's a practice and we need to work on it every day. All of us. Again, thank you both so much. Thank you for having us. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Yeah.